Hello, and welcome to the Dungeons on a Dime Metatopia panel. Today's topic is exploring history through tabletop role-playing games, challenging misconceptions through diverse voices. I'm Brian, and I'll be your moderator for this panel. I use he, him pronouns, and I run the entry-level publishing imprint Dungeons on a Dime. My focus is on making accessible, inclusive, and entry-level role-playing games so that everyone can enjoy storytelling at its finest. Today, I am joined by a whole host of really lovely people, so we're going to start by introducing ourselves and saying a little bit about what we do. So starting with Jeff, because you're in my top left corner, could you say a little bit about yourself? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jeff Sanders. I'm an archaeologist, and I work at the Society of Antiquities of Scotland, which is a 238-year-old organisation um, who does a whole raft of different things. One of the things is we run a project called Dig It, which is all about getting people involved in Scottish archaeology. One of the things I'm really keen to do is to see if we can use tabletop roleplay games to get across the stories of Scotland's past. Fantastic. Uh, next up is Lloyd, because you're in my middle. I should be, I should be the front. That's fine. I'll see the middle. Um, hi, my <laughs> name is Lloyd. Um, my name is Lloyd. I use he and pronouns. I am an RPG writer and generally work in the industry. I'm just some dude. I do some books, something here and there. Nothing that interesting at all. Don't worry about it. <laughs> next up is Lizzie on my top right. Uh, hi, I'm Lizzie Simonen. I use she, her pronouns. I am a fantasy writer who moonlight, moonlights as a librarian. Uh, I work for School Library Outreach in Glasgow. Uh, we uh, loan out books, um, other learning resources like artifacts, uh, you know, costumes, anything um, to schools in the city so that they can uh, access great materials without having to pay for them. And I'm working very hard to get role-playing games, tabletop role-playing games into Glasgow schools. That is a, such a fantastic resource as well, just for schools and for public in general. Is, uh, you do these really cool boxes, they just loan out, and they've got all sorts of topics. They're just amazing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, next up, bottom left, we have got Nathan. Hi, hi, hi. Hello, hello. I'm your androgynous Android game show host from the future, Nathan Blades. Nice to meet you. I use he, they pronouns, and I both write and uh, perform a wide variety of indie tabletop RPGs, uh, both on the Talent Agency podcast and the Neoncaster Twitch channel. Amazing. Next up, in my middle bottom, we have Justin. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Justin Weigard. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a PhD candidate at Michigan State University. Uh, my dissertation, and I guess a lot of my research focuses on using games in the classroom and also making games in the classroom. And I often try to incorporate uh, tabletop role playing games or just games of different kinds and, and forms into my literature classrooms, uh, particularly in terms of um, how we can get students to study them and make them as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And last but not least, we have got Sally. Hi everyone, I'm Sally Pentecost. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm an early career heritage professional uh, working in communications and policy making currently for the Digit project with Jeff. Um, and I also do communications for the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland too. I'm a lifelong Scottish history enthusiast or nerd. <laughs> I hold um, degrees in both history and medieval history and I've also played Dungeons and Dragons with my crew for just over four years now. Amazing. Oh, that's really cool. So for today's panel, we're gonna be talking about misconceptions. Now, what do I mean when I say misconception? Uh, what I consider that to be is information, fact, history, or something else that has been twisted or misrepresented because of internal bias. Those biases could be sexism, homophobia, racism, transphobia, or even well-intentioned miseducation through you know, society. A lot of the time we are taught things uh, in school, online, or we research ourselves, and actually the information that we believe is true is flawed or one-sided, and that can lead to misconceptions. And those misconceptions can be easily disseminated through friends and schools, uh, through our colleagues as well, and it can end up with this general idea that something is the way it is, but in actual fact, it wasn't like that at all. Uh, this panel today is talking about misconceptions, and it was inspired by a project I'm working on alongside Jeff and Lizzie. It's called Carved in Stone. The project is, uh, well, the project's goal is to make a tabletop role-playing game setting guide for uh, 9th century Scotland, so 800 AD and onwards. It's after the fall of Rome, and it's before the formation of what we really understand as Scotland nowadays. 
and it's all about clearing up a lot of the misconceptions in Scottish history and the perception of Scottish history, uh, typically written by a lot of older armchair white historians, um, and diversifying that with a whole host of different writers and illustrators working alongside uh, contemporary PhD archaeologists, so they're getting the freshest research and perspectives, and that and able to add in their own uh, basically inferences and understandings into that research, and then make a really cool interactive book that people can then explore that time period and understand it better. So it's really fun, but it's a very massive project. Um, it's a bit of uh, social discussion. It's a bit of education. It's just a bit of. Uh, like historical recontextualization, there's a lot of different factors coming into it. So I feel like a conversation like this panel is really good for understanding how we take information, how we essentially reconstitute it for people to digest, and sort of the misconceptions that we clear up as we do that, or that we encounter in our kind of day-to-day -day work cycle. So naturally, I think it makes sense to start the conversation with Jeff, because uh, he's in my top left, and uh, we've been talking about this the longest. So how we're going to do this is uh, Jeff, and we'll go bit by bit to everybody. You're going to introduce uh, what it's like working in archaeology right now for you, some of the misconceptions that you've encountered that might have annoyed you or that equally you're not sure how to deal with. And we'll talk about that process of turning rocks in the ground into information that people can be really excited about for Scotland. So Jeff, do you want to, yeah. you want to kick us off? Thanks, Brian. And I, I should have said uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, one of the things we've found about archaeology is that people generally tend to be kind of quite well disposed towards archaeology and archaeologists. But on the flip side, if you ask someone to describe an archaeologist, they'll probably say a white middle-aged professor with a beard and a bad jumper doing something that's kind of difficult. Um, and I think part of our role, um, yeah, no comments about the beard or the jumper, please. <laughs> <laughs> part of our role is to highlight that actually you can get involved in archaeology in loads of different ways. It, it's not difficult. Um, and it's important because archaeology helps uncover stories about the past. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we've got, certainly in Scottish archaeology, probably in archaeology um, as a whole, is that in the past, and sadly currently, a lot of people who've been uncovering and writing about the stories, um, they've done it in a, in a way that's very samey. So archaeology stretching all the way back, say, to the 19th century, has tended to be done by rich, white, middle-aged men, basically. And the narratives that we get just constantly recur. And so we kind of build on... Um, we build on um, archaeological narratives that were derived um, with ethnography that was out of date. Um, a lot of the best survey work in archaeology was done after the, um, the formation of the Ordnance Survey, but that was all by military. You know, all of the interpretations revolve around you know, the military. So one of the things that I'm really keen to do is to try and find a way not only of engaging people with the stories, but also giving them a bit of the power to, to start to riff off those stories and, 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 and tell their own. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the ninth century in Scotland, because it's a story that has, has traditionally been labeled the dark age, you know, that mm. leaves Scotland. And then what happens before we get Scotland as Scotland? Um, and it's not really a dark age. It's just that our understanding of this time, um, it, it, we don't have the same kind of level of sources, but now we do. Um, there's some amazing archaeological projects that are going on, and they're revealing what happens after the Romans leave. And it's fascinating. It's like it's a bit like Game of Thrones. You've got lots of little patchwork kingdoms fighting and struggling, and then kind of being put together and forming kind of bigger polities. And then, like the the Vikings arrive, you get new ideas that had come in with the Romans and then disappeared, but then they come back. You've got different of religion, different types of technology. It just feels like a kind of a really exciting period. But how do we get that across? And also importantly, how do we how do we empower people to kind of get involved in the story? And that's where I think role play games are are offer a huge um, amount. Um, actually, funny enough, just kind of ahead of this panel, I was um, I was doing a little bit of of, of background um, reading, and I saw Space eighteen eighty nine, which is one of the, the games that your company does, Lloyd. Yeah. <laughs> that in Dragon Magazine. 
um, and absolutely loving it. And that's the thing I like. It's the there's the 19th century aspect of that. And it, obviously, they didn't go into space in the 19th century. But you can still explore aspects of 19th century life, um, it, but just have that kind of wild setting. Um, and I, you know, I love that kind of that balance and that um, uh, juxtaposition. And I think the line between accuracy and imagination um, is, in our project, one that we're going to have to um, uh, uh, think about, um, you know, you know how, we, how we want to kind of um, uh, tread it. But I don't think that's necessarily a, um, a, um, a problem. So kind of one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm really keen on is, is communicating a much more basic message than even in the detail of the first millennium AD in Scotland. It's that these stories that we understand of history themselves change and are updated um, and aren't the final word. You know, there's, there's more to um, explore and, and uncover. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, that's kind of, um, we had a lot of success recently in a, a Minecraft project. And again, one of the, the things I loved about it is that it meets people halfway and kind of puts a lot, it gives a lot to them. You know, I can tell you about the archaeology. There's nothing I can tell you about Minecraft. Um, but people can go and kind of pick that up and riff you know, and, and, um, and, and, and kind of, you know, work away on it. And I'd be really keen to know, actually, from, from, from other panel members, you know, how you utilize um, kind of history and historic sources, um, either in, in, in game design, Lloyd, or, or in teaching, um, uh, uh, Justin. Okay. Can I jump in then? Go, 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 yeah, go, 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 go. Okay, <laughs> great. I thought you were so, more uh, intelligent than mine would be, so go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I think like the the easiest way for me to, to talk about it is how I talk about it in context. So this past spring, I got to teach a course, uh, an upper level popular literature course on um, uh, the course theme that I put together of playful literature and literary games. And so since I'm my background is in English, but I have specialties in, in games and comics. Um, this is also a little bit my opportunity to sort of throw everything, including the kitchen sink, at my students. Um, but the, the real outcomes for the course were to have students really critically study games as textual artifacts, games as these this really unique medium that's really born of, you know, this idea of play. And so one of the ideas that I really tried to get across to them is that to understand games, you have to actually play through them in the same way that we read through literature in the same way that we read through comics, right? And so for historical context, uh, I'm really fortunate because Michigan State has a special collection on zines, actually. And so I got to bring my students to our library over to the special collection on zines, and they got to... Uh, and I got to work with our, our great librarian, Joshua Barton, um, and they set up a really incredible showcase of like 40 or 50 zines, and they kind of just spread them out. And so my students, most of whom who do not know what zines are, let alone, you know, their history, right? Uh, they got to work with these zines and kind of just explore them. They got to pick them up and see how radical and weird and amazing zines are. And I did that to give them some historical foundations because I wanted them to start playing through other game zines because I really wanted my students to feel empowered enough to make their own games products. So we also played through some other traditional games. We played through, we had a section on board games. We had a section on video games where we all played um, Tetris as a class, which was really fun and goofy. And I got to play Tetris on a giant projector screen. Uh, <laughs> you take the win in, in academia. Um, and, and then it, about halfway through the course, uh, we switched to tabletop role-playing games and, and game zines. And I gave them, you know, a broad history on the history of role-playing games, um, particularly kind of couching it in, um, you know, it starts a lot with not, not fully, but it starts a lot with Dungeons and Dragons, but also pushing pressure on, um, you know, the fact that Dungeons and Dragons is also very dominant. It's very hegemonic. It is, you know, kind of the probably what most of my students know, you know, RPGs from in a lot of ways. And also talked about this sort of through line of indie creators and people from the margins uh, making game zines, making their own indie role-playing games. 
And as a first gen scholar student, um, you know, I really wanted to empower my students to feel like they could start making their own thing. So we devoted the second half of the semester to making game zines on issues of play or their own games. And it was really exciting to me because I had some students do like some historical things, but I also had students who made uh, games about like gamifying the punk rock experience of being at a show and like there being bottles getting smashed everywhere or things like that. But I also had students who made games about, um, uh, I had one student uh, and I, I really loved this game. Um, I think Claudia's game was called Happy, Happy Trails. And it was just a 12 page game about happy experiences on a road trip. And so the big thing for me to kind of circle back to the theme was clearing up misconceptions about making games and the critical study of games being very monolithic and oppressive. And the fact that they have inroads to doing these things and that not only that, but their voices are necessary. We need more people making games. We need more people in academia um, who are not white cis hat dudes uh, controlling the game's narrative, but we need so many more diverse voices. And I was trying to create a space for that kind of inclusive space, I guess. That is a really comprehensive yeah. answer, dude. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just like, I'm not, even, I'm not gonna put a say it, I'm just gonna leave. I just, I <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I have had so many cool tangent thoughts about connections we already have going on here. So obviously we've got empowerment through interacting with very recent history. I mean, without going into a whole spiel about zines, even though I help run the Edinburgh Zine Library, uh, zines have only been around in the sense of photocopiers for the last like 50 years. And even then, yeah. media from 50 years ago is starting to degrade, or maybe 60, 70, uh, because time does pass. But it's not been a super long time in terms of human history. And if we take the concept of zines, they've only been around since the beginning of the printing press, which is the kind of the original zine, taking handwritten manuscripts and turning them into mass-produced media that anyone can have, converting the Bible into English, that sort of stuff, putting empowerment in people's hands. So getting students to interact with that is really empowering for their voice because then it teaches them they can make their own stuff and make their own games and then distribute them themselves. Uh, and to kind of draw another person to the conversation, I think it'd be really interesting to hear from Sally about some of the other kinds of ways that, uh, or avenues for connecting people with history, where you've got original pieces of history and uh, the different ways that's been interacted through, say through Digit or through uh, the Society of Antiquaries. Yeah, I think the... The thing that my colleague Julianne and I, we both work for Digit. Julianne's the comms manager, I'm the comms officer. Um, something that we've uh, really lent into in the last couple of years, and now there's just no going back and nor should there be, we're just taking this forward, is um, that we can't tell these stories on our own and nor should we. Um, we need, as the communications officer and manager for Digit, it's our job to help find these voices and, and bring them into the fold and just how though they can put such a different spin on things um, that we wouldn't have thought of. I mean, something that we've been doing um, for the last year and a half, two years or so is building up our, what is essentially a blog page. It's called our discover page on the website, which is, uh, short three to 800 word articles on any aspect of Scottish archaeology, um, debunking myths, uh, in-depth case studies, um, limericks, cool stories, our top 10 sites, we, we do a lot of stuff. Um, and we have over 100 of them now um, by lots of different authors. And uh, some of the most recent ones that have proved the most popular are ones where we're exploring um, known archaeological sites or cases um, through a different perspective. So we asked uh, the freelancer Sasha Coward, I don't know if any of you guys know mm -hmm. him, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. nodding enthusiastically. Obsessed yeah, Sasha... with mermaids, the coolest guy. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> obsessed with mermaids. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Sasha Coward is a freelancer based in the UK, um, who is a museums and heritage professional, and he also creates escape rooms. And like Nathan said, obsessed with mermaids. Um, and he uh, 
took on um, an article commission that we asked him to do, looking at um, a series of Viking graves in Scotland that in the original uh, literature that the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland has on its on its open access page um, assumes are the burials of either male or female uh, people solely based on the objects that are buried with them. Because at the time when they were they were discovered, um, we didn't have DNA analysis um, and we couldn't tell the biological sex of, of human remains at that time. And so they assumed that the burial with the big sword and the axe and the shield naturally belongs to a male Viking warrior. And then jewellery and household items therefore make it um, a woman. And of course, we know now that that's not an accurate way to um, sex or even just tell any kind of identifying markers of, um, of human remains. And that's what this article was for. And we're having another one done quite soon um, with another heritage freelancer, Claire Mead, about women with swords in Scottish archaeology. So I think our, yeah, our main takeaway in the last couple of years has been how um, it's not necessarily mine and Julianne's job as the communications employees at Digit uh, to be able to tell these stories ourselves. It's about bringing more people into the fold and, and making sure that all those voices are heard. Again, I'm just in awe of all the really cool answers people are kind of constructing here. It's really cool. Um, one of the, the things in terms of a, a collaborative element that I'm finding interesting is that it's about curating and uplifting other people uh, around you. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I say that because uh, how do you uh, work to get uh, your your cast your net so to speak further out and reach people who might not be able to get that opportunity and make sure that it's not just uh uplifting the same i say the same people over and over again not that that is what's happening but do you, do you get what i'm saying <laughs> mm, yeah. absolutely do you mind um, if i jump in on that real quick yeah um, it was a question yeah. for you i think <laughs> oh thank you sorry I'll, I'll be super quick lloyd um yeah it's something that we're um we're facing right now in that we made a decision um about a year ago to um when if we were going to uh, not just write the articles ourselves and we were going to cast the net wider and ask people to uh, write for us that we had to pay them it's only right and that you know offering payment breaks down or starts to break down some of those barriers that might stop people from uh, contributing their knowledge and experience and you know just Pay your freelancers folks just like I'll, I'll have it tattooed on my forehead next time pay your freelancers um that we wouldn't have been able to um get some of the um freelancers like sasha coward and like claire mead unless we were able to pay them and as a project as as a small project sometimes that can be hard to find the money but there are funding streams out there. Jeff is a fantastic project manager and usually that he has a black book of um, places where we can <laughs> apply for funds. Um, and so, for example, we, uh, my colleague Julianne um, ran a fantastic project uh, earlier this year to coincide with our um, annual celebration um, during the, the summer months of Scottish archaeology. <clears throat> um, to commission three individual pieces <clears throat> of digital art um from three different digital artists who reimagined uh, a scene from the past based on an artifact or a site that was uncovered this year and yeah. the the one that turned out to be my favorite um was one that took um the discovery of a 450 year old grave slab in the black isle in the highlands of scotland um that was uncovered in a graveyard by a community group and created a, a really beautiful vibrant comic strip you can see it on our website um of the stone carver carving the grave slab 450 years ago and a young blind girl coming and being able to feel the carvings um at the time and the and the grave uh, the guy who's carving the grave slab being able to show her this and this was something that um 
the artist came up with in talks with the community group because it's something that the community group do now um, in terms of offering sensory exploration with people in their community right now and she thought that was a really awesome way of um, in weaving it into the story and um, bringing the past and present together and also it's um, wonderful to see disabled representation in archaeology and that's like my favorite one of the three and I would encourage you to go and have a look at the others as well right that's my bit that is a really lovely answer uh, Lloyd did you have something to <laughs> say before uh, I had a lot but like it's in between what oh Sam yeah was saying so I'm, gonna try, <laughs> I'm just trying to I'm gonna fire through as fast as I can go 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 uh, the first one the first one is I totally understand the idea about history changing and how conceptions are formed because of things doing, because we have a very easy example of that in our daily lives that I can reference, which is the rules of Monopoly. Monopoly mm -hmm. has been going on, we've not been up for like a hundred years, right? And every single person plays it differently because mm -hmm. every person when they take Monopoly transcribes it, reads it and translates it in different ways. And it's one of the very easy ways to show how people have taken Monopoly and changed the idea of it to make this, to basically ruin the rules <laughs> to become a really complex and kind of unfair and also really long game compared to the much shorter game that was made to show the horribleness of landlords and how <laughs> terrible they are at everything else. Landlords are evil. Just, <laughs> I'm gonna put that one out there, I'll just let you know. <laughs> That's like one of the very easy ways of going about misconceptions and things coming from the past that have been changing. I'm not saying all new rules of Monopoly are bad. I'm just saying you should play the original rules once at least. The second one is on the idea of zines. Zines have not just have not just been used as methods of information and of entertainment. They've also been used as methods of getting certain things across that you may not be able to otherwise. In Ghana, for example, we have music zines. Back in the days when we didn't have the internet, so I couldn't just go in there and look up the lyrics to Baby Got Back. You had to look it up in a music zine. There'll be small old books made of the latest songs that are popular in Ghana, and they'll go around and you'd buy them, or most, most likely someone will just give it to you because it's still like this. And you would have these music zines that you could open up with all, this, all the lyrics written on it, so then you could sing along to the song in the language that you barely understood, but you can sing along to the song because the lyrics are all written down there in that nice little mm -hmm. easy form way. And that's like one of the really other ways I, can't, like, I was I wanted to bring up about zines being very powerful in today's day and age in getting certain words across. But the problem with them was that they were always special types because not everyone got the lyrics right. <laughs> so then you had the problem of knowing which zine group would have the right lyrics to the right songs because <laughs> Unfortunately, surprisingly enough, the Black Album didn't come with the lyrics in the book, which was really annoying, so you couldn't just look it up yourselves. So you had to look it up in the zine, and three zines had three different translations. <laughs> Especially this is sounding a lot like fun fan subtitling anime. <laughs> oh boy! I mean, I was, that was actually, I was about to say the same thing comes with subtitled anime, for those of you who watch anime, where you have you will have like, you will have the Zura scan version or the manga version. You would have the Batato version. You'd have all the different versions that once put down. Someone will come up and say people die when they're killed. Someone will say, that's not what he meant. He meant something else. And it's just, it's, it's, it's really hard to get a unified, I mean, nowadays, especially, it's really hard to get a unified voice when it comes to translating things into a nice, easy, understandable phrase of word. And when it comes to making role-playing games, for example, I always, you always, everyone always has to think about the audience that they're going to and how they want that to be read. And some people are really attracted to a certain type of writing and will shun others like they are the devil. Games like Morkbook, for example, has this really gritual writing going, yeah, read a book and when you're done, burn it. And I'm like, ah! A man to tell me how to make the game work, okay? Whereas some, <laughs> some role playing games would be like, right, you do this, do it that way, but that's not how you do it. Some people are like, why, why, why are you telling me what to do? It's my game. I'll do what I want. Mm. I'll mistranslate this Monopoly game if I want. You can't tell me. And that's kind of the difficulty you have when it comes to audio games. Okay, that's my fact, my quick way. Carry on. Well, I want mm -hmm. to piggyback off of the writing and role playing games and d considering the audience you're writing for and what effect you want to convey. I'm in the middle of, or pretty much like 90% way 
uh, through finishing the manuscript for my latest Kickstarter, Vice and Virtue. Oh, um, so it's a... Uh, oh, what's the spiel I had in my head? It is a system neutral uh, uh, subsystem. So basically it works with any role-playing game and the idea is that it is super fancy roll tables, basically, as my editor describes it, uh, but for uh, scenarios. So the idea is that players have the agency, they choose where the story goes, but you have a bunch of prepared content that is for all of the directions they want to go in. Um, it's only 2,000 words, but we have been hemming and whoring back and forth, Vi and myself, very positively. It's been a really fun experience, but really choosing which words we use, the names of different terms in the game, what is being used, where it's structured, the order of things, because we want to communicate a very specific idea of collaborative storytelling, of players having control, of it being a conversation, and instilling a lot of really good values in role-playing games that are still quite difficult for some grognards to, to really latch onto. And then reinforcing those with some very gentle mechanics so that anyone who's coming to this, new, experienced or otherwise, can learn these skills and also have a good time. And just the, the amount of times we have like put a sentence in and then taken it out and then sort of, mm, do we need to have it in there? Will people use the absence of this sentence as an excuse to do harm, to have, to make a bad time at the table? Is this sentence doing more if it is here or can we take it out for simplicity? Like that has been a really interesting conversation. Um, and it's been really fun working on it. I, I love writing games so much. Um, but it, I hadn't considered in the sense that I'm writing for this specific audience, when we're writing historical documentation, when we're talking about experiences, places, worlds, uh, just how much we have to focus how we present that through the words, because even our intention can be misread in just the way that we write. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm going to, I could go either way with the kind of the thoughts I'm having about this. We could either go to uh -huh. Nathan who works with podcasting and tabletop role-playing game and that collaborative story, or we could go to Lizzie, who sure. works with education and schools and presenting this to whole classrooms of kids. So who will want to take this one up? <laughs> I don't think we want to end on something lowbrow, so I'll go first. Um, <laughs> I mean, real talk, uh, I kind of, these days I've been kind of branding the stuff that I work on as loud gay trash uh, as affectionately as possible, because I'm... <laughs> Um, we, we are currently kind of going through an indie RPG renaissance of changing what games really mean. And that's great for uh, personal experiences where it's not recorded, but as actual play, the process of actually recording games for the entertainment of people. We're actually doing a performance art here and not just like a lyric game performance art. You'll play this book and then you will not tell anybody what's in the book, but the emotions will live inside. No, people need to know the thing that I'm doing is super entertaining <laughs> and the viewing figures that I have on my content genuinely matters <laughs> to how long I keep making content for. So, uh, and entertainment and also conveying useful information is kind of the, the, the gig. Um, so I guess there's two like topics about that, talking mm. about how I approach how I run games and how I interpret RPGs, and I'll talk a little about my the players and what we do in terms of collaborative storytelling. So I've said in a handful of places that uh, I have never played a tabletop RPG entirely as intended, including the ones that I write myself, and I have no intent of starting now. Um, <laughs> because I uh, a, a lot of tabletop RPGs are concerned about lore and setting, and spending a large part of like a 300 page hardback establishing what the world is supposed to be and i don't could care. i could <laughs> i just clarify do you mean law law like the rule no no no, no. law is in -E. setting yeah l-o-r-e cool. setting setting um because i i don't know um I, I i bounced off a lot of uh high fantasy historical fiction uh because you don't see faces like mine in them and you do now a bit more but the ship has shed the ship has sailed we've moved on to cyberpunk now at least personally <laughs> um so i've been exploring lots of other settings that kind of explore topics of wider diversity and representation of myself but even then not doing a super great job at it a lot of the time um i uh, you know if you're if your cyberpunk fiction doesn't include uh queer and disabled people it's not cyberpunk i'm sorry <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you um so i'm I'm going to have to put all that content in myself. I can't rely on Shadowrun, who is eternally obsessed with including uh, ancient Indian burial grounds in their work and calling that diverse, um, to go and do the representation. So i got to do, do it, I guess. And there's a level of authenticity that goes in there. Um, 
you know, I, I, I think a lot of the scenarios that I end up writing for my friends to play for record are largely about the queer experience. Uh, they're also about the uh, UK entertainment industry because I know that from my actual job. Um, Nathan, when are you going to stop making games that are your weird opinion? opinions about art the answer is never never um <laughs> so yeah the, those kind of authenticities kind of come into the work and kind of explaining uh my the own voices perspective of the world that we live in reflected in a fictional world that is surprisingly alarmingly disastrously close to our own um and then when it comes to actually the game mechanics what i tend to then glom onto are uh mechanics that are really evocative of uh, a specific experience you know, I want to play a game with rules that will make me and my players feel the specific type of way. And it doesn't need to cover all stories because there are a billion different systems out there. So I don't need one system that can do everything. And I don't want to try and cram in lots of different ways to run in one game. Dungeons and Dragons, I'm looking at you. <laughs> DM's Guild is a very lucrative enterprise, but you can play other games. It's allowed. Um, so, yeah, uh, finding really evocative experiences. Uh, and then also uh, experiences that, you know, play well for time uh, because, you know, uh, the listenership, listen to podcast length. So it's got to be ideas and concepts and stories that make sense within three hours, ideally within one and a half. Um, so, so games that can kind of play in that short period of time and you get the vibe and experience is also quite important. So there's a lot of... Question? Mm -hmm, go ahead. So about the taking... Uh, experiences that aren't, say, Indian burial grounds and diversifying your games and creating your own media that's divergent from the canon, so to speak. Uh, what compromises do you feel you have to make when it comes to your time constraints, to how much you want to show to your audience and how much you want to tell to your audience, and as well as maintaining player agency um, in your games and allowing your cast to make their own decisions without being like, no, we're going on a whistle-stop tour of this thing because I have an agenda. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, uh, I guess um, I'm a really big fan of mystery writing uh, in, in my RPGs. Uh, that, that is something I think is actually also quite uncommon. So I get to carve out my own little niche in the industry. Um, uh, and that requires a decent amount of structure, but also giving players the room to explore the space, ask questions, find clues, make conclusions themselves. So I'm big on setting frameworks for uh, like a mission. I'm, I'm a big fan of a mission for people to go on because that is really tight a three hour experience. They don't need to wander off into hills that don't have anything to do with the plot at hand and all that. So uh, I can, to tie those two ideas together of a, a, a specific walled garden that they can explore in, but also ideas, uh, there could be, for example, um, a game session I did recently was about a 18 year old uh, drag artist um, who really wanted to explore that particular art form, but wasn't particularly open to his friends and family about it. And uh, um, urban fantasy stuff happens and the kind of like a uh, nature that he's been suppressing about his need to perform and for people to love him, even though he, he's not a good performer yet, comes out and shenanigans occur. Uh, and which is a, a nice kind of like missing person story that then turns into an interesting urban fantasy nature. So everybody's going along for that kind of ride. But then I also get to talk about drag culture within this particular arc. Um, I get to talk about uh, what goes on in like filmmaking, but also um, this is an abandoned film studio and there are mandragoras running around uh, who are actually the ghosts of the people that were in this building when it became to life. So you get to do the fancy kind of, ooh, this is high fantasy intrigue, but also here are some concepts that I might, concepts that I might not know. Um, sometimes that's then a, a, a thing that I have to do a lot of research on. Uh, and this is where the kind of like important bit comes in because when it starts drifting outside of my own experience, I want to go and tell a story that while I can't claim authenticity, um, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess to a degree, everything that we do with the veneer of other people to enjoy is going to be at least partially fake as hell. So I'm not going to I'm not going to say that my my storytelling is going to be the most authentic, but I am going to 
make sure it's not problematic. And that level of baseline reading, and then maybe having to ask people, um, you know, having uh, trans characters in my work, people with chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, people who are maybe deaf and use sign language, and representing all those kind of things in the setting. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of uh, actual, just general common sandy. Diego aspects about the world <laughs> and making sure I get that right. Uh, I, I entirely, uh, <laughs> I, I think for one episode of my podcast, I said that Barcelona was in Portugal, then had to go back to the same room. I know I'm dumb. I'm mad <laughs> stupid. Uh, go back to the same room for the same like audio and say Lisbon, a whole bunch of different ways. <laughs> so <I can> <laughs> myself. <laughs> and the secret was kept but not anymore because I've now revealed it to the general internet. But I fact checked myself and went back and fixed the content. So at least when you're listening to it, I sound like I have a modicum of two brain cells. Um, <laughs> and then finally to tie that up and then talk about my players. Um, having a really diverse player base is also super important. Avoiding just the age old joke of what do you call three white guys in the microphone, a podcast. Um, just making sure that the player experiences and the stories that they're interested in telling are going to be reflecting of their own circumstances in the same way that the stories that I write and scenarios that I write are reflective of my own circumstances. I'm really lucky in that I have a minimal number of straight friends. So I actually already have a pretty uh, diverse pool of people to play with in my content as like baseline. I didn't have to, I didn't have to scout I'm not like, oh man, I've got this big RPG idea, but I need uh, the Burger King Kids Club to join my group. So <laughs> I look. <laughs> I'm lucky I don't need to jump through those hoops. My my players are wonderful, and I'm blessed to have them as both friends and fellow performers. Um, and that, yeah, that that really that really gives a lot of breadth and depth to our stories because what they want to tell then reflects the scenarios that I introduce in the stories as we go forward. So it's because it's collaborative storytelling. This isn't just a book that I write and make them run through. Um, and occasionally they also want to kind of take on uh, the mantle of doing some personal research about their character and the character's world and how that might reflect uh, on. So one of my, one of the campaigns we're currently playing, Arcana Core, uh, uh, one of my players, Ruben, is playing Goin Lapis Blue, who is uh, American Korean. Um, has a has an African American dad and the Korean mother, and the culture that he is torn between as a teenager who doesn't quite understand the world is understanding both those worlds and still forming out his own identity therein. So he's doing a lot of work on his own time to kind of be able to role play that authentically in the space. Um, he he himself is a mixed race person, so he kind of understands having two separate worlds. Uh, and sharing that and being his own person in between. So it's still reflecting himself, but he's doing that extra mile to kind of uh, accurately reflect some parts of it and then going fantastical with other parts of it as the story desires. And uh, pour all that together and mix that all together. And then you ideally uh, have a story that is super wild and anarchic, but also grounded in ways that your viewers will find relatable or whatever. <laughs> Whistle stop tour. Sorry, I talked a lot. <laughs> I feel like we all talk a lot, so you're in good company. Uh, I feel like a good a question I've got from that is, what is your research mm. process? And if you know it, what does the research process of your players look like uh, when it comes to understanding the roles? I say this because with Carved in Stone, one of the, the ideal goals is that someone can take this and it's all of the research they need in a single place. So it's got mm. all the bibliography in the back. You've got all the PhDs comments being like this and this and this. And we know that we had this and there's a like, lovely little bit of history. But it's also, as a piece of prose, readable as a rule system. So you should go, oh, yep, yeah, I do this. There's this place here. I can walk over here. Fish is worth mm -hmm. this much. It fluctuates because of this. And you can use it as a essentially a tool to then go experience 9th century Scotland. Uh, mm -hmm. What does the research process look like as performers and as people who are playing for other people as well as for yourselves? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, I, I have I have a good friend. Uh, her name is Google, and she is available at all hours of the day and will answer <laughs> any questions. Um, because sometimes it's that simple, and I've definitely worked with people uh, professionally and not who have refused to look up a thing when actually it's uh, not too bad. The the idea is I, I have a journalist background, so my I, I know to try and pull if I can three sources that say the same thing. And then I know mm. that it's not fakey fake BS. Um, mm -hmm. 
And I can't, uh, there, there, there's, I, I can politely suggest that to the people that I play with, but I can't necessarily demand that of them. Um, but I, I, I feel that I play with people who are enthusiastic about trying to uh, represent things accurately, even though we might get some things wrong sometimes, and that's entirely fine. I think part of playing with an audience is that you're going to ideally, fortunately, if you pray hard enough, have members of your listenership that are actually from some of that have that kind of experience and knowledge and can pull you up on it if you're wrong and that's actually a blessing because they're in a position they clearly care enough about the work that you're putting out uh to tell you that it could be better <laughs> and uh, that's a blessing in disguise because most people will listen to your work and say nothing <laughs> You'll never know that you have a fan until you say something wrong, and then they'll tell you that you did something wrong. That's the only interaction you're going to get. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Occasionally, the the listener audience ship uh, can can kind of step up and tell you uh, information that is useful to play, and then you can incorporate that in and grow. But often, often it's just just reading up about it because I can't really guarantee that the stories. I, I'm I, I at least at time of recording, I'm not telling stories that are in a specific time period, period or location. I'm not really one for period pieces. So having to do that advanced research about the world being historically accurate and consistent isn't really important to the stuff mm. I'm presently telling, unfortunately. But I do small feel like it is, I do feel like mm, it is ahead. very relevant though, because you're trying to be accurate to human experience and that might not necessarily be a mm. time period, but understanding how people have experienced uh, trauma or, or, or phobia or anything that's been going on like that is just as important. It might not necessarily be bound to a specific time period because these sort of things span large periods of, of time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whole centuries. So it's not just like, oh, in this year, this building existed. It's like, well, for the last 300 years, there's been slavery. So you get to kind of look through all sorts of cool, and not cool, interesting <laughs> subjects, digest that information and turn it to a character. And I feel mm. like there is a lot of relevance between those two experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A, a lot of the writing for the cyberpunk content was kind of you know um world circumstances through the lens of interesting fiction so there's lots of understanding about the wider world uh the arcana core campaign which is run in city of mist which specifically if you've not heard of city of mist as a system it's a, a it's almost a superhero noir where every character has a mythos a, a uh, an entity from the world of fiction or mythology that is giving them superpowers and it's them growing to understand their mythos but also be themselves in the world which I'm using as like a persona video game kind of like mm. inspired spin-off it works alarmingly well but that uh understanding of the mythos that you're running is kind of key to running the character correctly so you end up doing a little bit of research and deep dives into the mythos that you want your character to be unless you're cheating and you want to make like spider-man your mythos or something but even then you probably want to go and do research right <laughs> I, I should hope that if you're going to take the coward's way out and choose a modern pop culture character for your mythos that you would actually <laughs> go and see what they're about in the larger scheme of things but yes in in the micro scale at the very least if you're going to be uh, exploring a piece of mythology or a piece of world fact about your character, going and doing those pieces of research to understand that well, I think is also useful for the acting side of it. I think it's probably what you're leading to. Um, believable acting can be done in many, many different ways. It's not always just method acting. Uh, or classical acting is where is the style that involves a lot of uh, in-depth historical research to truly embody a character. And that can be really, really valuable, especially if you're the kind of person that likes to write a couple of pages of backstory, because uh, then you, you're you tying all that information together. Uh, I, I tend to be more of the uh, Chekhov school of thought in that I just vibe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but when, yeah, I, 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 I'm, all, I'm all about vibing uh, and minimal research if I can get away with it. But if there is a specific sensitive topic doing that, doing those kind of pieces of research I find is essential. Mm. And speaking of mm -hmm. specific research, I think this is a good segue point to go over to Lizzie, mm -hmm. whose job, as I understand it, is to assemble uh, specific boxes as well as work with libraries uh, for schools. So taking topics and then digesting them into a specific set of resources that teachers can then take, use, and then teach that subject. So having just horribly misexplained it, Lizzie, could you please correct me? <laughs> I, it, that sounds very glamorous, that job. Um, unfortunately, I exist sort of in, I exist in the world of mainstream publishing. So we get what they decide to publish. And of course, you know, I, I, I know things from the writer's side of it too. Um, there's more effort being put into uh, uplifting marginalized voices. Uh, but still, the majority of books out there are not 
by marginalized people. Um, it's actually really funny sometimes. There's there's topics that are very easy to get books for children about. Vikings, huge. Everyone loves Vikings. They're the new pirates. Um, Scotland specific topics, and then especially Glasgow specific topics, you're looking at less and less and less. Um, so it 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 can be telling what sort of is available, uh, what's easy to come by, and what's um, you know like with Glasgow, it's we get a new book every once in a while. Uh, it might be for children. Um, yeah, so I I don't I don't know that I can answer much on the research side of things. Um, it's been really funny. It could be interesting to, to see. Sorry, it's yeah. really interesting no, to see the sort of problems that you face because in an ideal world, it's like you you put your hands out the window and a bird drops by with a book and you're like, aha, the knowledge. But in reality, what does it look like to try and assemble specific topics for a whole curriculum? Of course. Um, I mean, there's the whole boring side of, well, we have this book supplier, we have to buy from them and they're based in England. And so it's all <laughs> English stuff. Like there's, there's that. There's also the whole thing that really has been eye-opening for me as an American who's come in to Scotland to do this work and just finding things that are in British English rather than American English. I'm finding like, there's so many more books. I, I put, I did put together these boxes that we just called diversity. Cause we're like, this is everything. Um, which like, God help me. I don't know why I thought that was achievable in a box, the size of a shoe box, but there we are. Um, so, uh, finding like stories um, with LGBT characters, which normally at the age range we're looking at, right? This is Sarah has two mommies sort of narrative or like the Julian is a mermaid uh, where it's that sort of, this is a person exploring the ways in which they're different, but you know, we're not calling it sexuality. We're not calling it gender because he's eight. You know, it's like he likes to dress up like a mermaid. Cool. We're going with that. Um, so that's kind of what we get in our age range, because um, I mostly do like primary school. Um, most of those narratives still tend to be very American centric. Um, if the child depicted in the story is going to school, there's American words being used. They go to recess. You know, they go to the cafeteria. I don't know if that's even the word here. They get in line. Um, and I think that there's children here that are used to those words because they hear them on TV. They're used to these Americanized stories. Um, but yeah, seeing yourself depicted in fiction is huge. There's more recognition of that for, you know, having a queer character, having a character of color, you know, having these stories being told by people, you know, from those marginalized groups. Um, but Glasgow is a, a very proudly working class city. And just having a story that depicts working class children in Scotland is so rare, but also so important. And when we find those stories and they really just come along, we grab onto them and use them as much as we can. Um, I should have looked up when it came out, but years ago, um, I mean, within the last 10 years, there was a book that came out um, by Teresa Breslin called Divided City. And it's about sectarianism in Glasgow as experienced by boys who are like under the age of 10. Um, and so many schools have used that book. Uh, you go into classroom, I, I get to visit schools a lot, or I used to pre-COVID, um, and they would have huge displays up in their classroom about Divided City because that's what they were working on. Um, another big book that we have really tried to promote a lot is called The Fox Girl and the White Gazelle by Victoria Williamson. Victoria is or was a school teacher in Drum Chapel, I think. Um, and the book manages to hit like every every topic you can think of. The the two main characters. There's a girl who she's um, she's Scottish. She lives in a single family home. Her mother has alcoholism. She has a lisp and she's bullying other children and taking their money to like buy food. Uh, and then a family moves into her um, building, uh, who they're ref they're asylum seekers from Syria. And so you also get the girl from that family who's, who's the, you know, these two girls are the same age, they go to the same school, these wildly different experiences, uh, but they managed to bond. Um, and it's set in Drum Chapel. I think it's called like Drum Hill, which is not a real place, but um, uh, it, and so it uses all the right words and it uses relevant, you know, locations. And, and we've had some teachers say, oh, that's, we, we have children who are going through, you know, rough times. They don't need a book that's really sad and depressing, although it has a happy ending. Um, but there have been other teachers who are like, 
oh my God, that's what these kids are like. That's what life is like. Um, and I often find actually that that children's fiction in general, this, the stories that children can handle are way, way more serious than many adults give them credit for. And that's partially because they're resilient and partially because that's what their lives are like. You know, they, they have experienced hardship and, and sorrow and grief. Um, the, yeah, the other thing with my work that I would like to touch on is just like the, the, um, getting kids playing tabletop role playing games, um, is a way to create worlds in which they are represented and worlds that reflect their worlds. Um, this carved in stone project is, you know, um, it's set in Scotland um, and we want to set it around um, uh, archaeological sites. So the first one being the Govan Stones here in Glasgow, which is a real place that kids from this city can go to. I mean, so many kids here, you know, we have a lot of very deprived areas. And so to be able to have a tangible thing that is the setting for this world that they'll interact with is huge. Um, and also, yeah, they get to be the characters in their story. They get to they get to be what they want to be um, and have characters that reflect them. Um, from the education side of things, there's so much value in tabletop role playing games and role playing in general um, for children. Um, so many social skills that can be learned. Um, there's literacy. Um, you know, we uh, we originally were just trying to get Dungeons and Dragons into schools, and I was really determined about this because there's so much written material. Like those, the the player's handbook is a beast, but kids read it. And, and, and a particular type of reader or, you know, enthusiastic player will read it all cover to cover because there's really high incentive to read it. Because if you want to play the game, you need to read all these words. Similarly, there's so much tie in material and stuff. You know, they've got the they've got the young adventurers handbooks and stuff now. Um, but any game system, you do have to do the reading. Often you have to do numeracy. There's a limited calculation of odds. You know, is it worth rolling for this or not? Um, and yeah, there's just the interaction around the table, uh, the face to face, the negotiation, the putting on a character. Um, there was, oh, Brian, you told me about it and I never can remember what the study was, but a study that showed that people when recounting experiences that they had role played, if they were successful, they would say, oh, I punched the dragon in the face and it was awesome. <laughs> if they were unsuccessful, they say, oh, well, you know, Herbert got, you know, lit on fire by the dragon, but, you know, it's okay. And there's a, there's a safe distance between, you know, the, the success is yours, but there's a safe distance between you and the failure. How enormous is that for children uh, or for anybody, really? Um, <laughs> so I, I think there's been a lot of effort into trying to communicate those values um, to teachers because they, the I mean, talk about misconceptions, you know, what do they think? They think, it's Dungeons and Dragons. They think it's fighting. There's usually an assumption that the players are battling each other, um, which I mean, the kids are all playing Fortnite right now. You know, it's the battle royale is what everyone expects it to be. And when you say no, like with a tabletop role playing game, most of the time it's cooperative. Obviously, there might be, you know, like situations where you're trying to like, I don't know, mafia or something. Um, or among us, like there's someone trying to kill everybody. But normally with, with these kinds of games, um, you're a team. And just communicating that simple thing can be really difficult. Um, and actually the, the way that I, mo I finally convinced my boss after six months of saying, hey, we should, we should do these games. I finally got Brian to come in and we, play, we played Honey Heist <laughs> with a bunch of teachers who had never played anything before. And after it, my boss was like, Oh, I get it now. <laughs> so the education is doable, but it does often involve sitting people down at a table and being like, do it and see and experience it. Um, and you can't, you can't communicate that easily in many other ways. I, I like, went on many tangents there. Sorry. I feel like entry level games like Honey Heist, like single page games, low yeah. word count, easy to understand, explain under 10 minutes are so important for role-playing games as a whole genre because we had a whole age range and a whole range of people around that table. We had like eight teachers. One of them was in her 60s. Uh, another one was like one of those like young and ready to go and all sorts of different kind of ranges of, of think, classroom they were coming the, from. 
the individual in their 60s, I think they, they were supposed to be like an incompetent panda or something. And yep. we're really sort of like, oh, but then they had to get past a crowd of people. And, and the, the incompetent panda went, oh, look at me. I'm so fluffy and cute and distracted <laughs> the whole crowd. And it was brilliant. And that individual went from being like, oh, I'm useless to I saved the day. It was amazing to watch. I'll never and forget. It was an hour. It was an hour. And we turned six people who had been like, oh, you know, is that satanic nerd game to like, let's play war. And <laughs> yeah, I think those sorts of experiences are very important and it can be very difficult to essentially sit people down. There's never enough time in the day to, to have that first game with everyone. Um, can I can I just riff off something that um, that Lizzie was talking about? Please just then? go ahead. Um, but first of all, prefacing with, um, I can attest that I've been playing D and D for over four years now, and if I speak to my mum soon after a weekly session, she still asks me every time. So who won this time? Yeah. Like, <laughs> four years, but we'll get there in the end. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about how um, important the um the resources are the reading material that you have um with a tabletop rpg is in making people feel inclusive i i was having this discussion um with somebody the other day about inclusivity um in the game in preparation for this panel and i guess they they acknowledge that there is a problem with um people from certain groups or communities not feeling at home in the game but they didn't see the game itself or the people who uh, write the resources for the game as being in any way responsible for that. It's that because in theory, you can do whatever you want to do, be whoever you want to be in the game, that therefore the responsibility is solely on the players and the DM of that group to foster inclusivity. And I didn't agree because I think when I first started out in D&D &D, and still four years on, I returned to the player's handbook, the dungeon master's guide, the monster manual. Um, and what is written in those resources um, when we're helping to flesh out, even if we're not playing a predetermined scenario and we're creating our own world, the world and the characters that we create are guided by these resources and so the language in them is is so important and it's been encouraging um i would be curious to hear about other people's um thoughts as well it has been encouraging i think since this summer that wizards of the coast um have seemed to have taken this a bit more seriously and they've announced revisions and updates for certain older and outdated texts and employing sensitivity readers um from different communities where there have certain characters um, and races, I don't even think we're going to be using the term races going forward, um, have been built, they're not racist in themselves, but they have been built off harmful stereotypes and mm. language um, that mirrors treatment of communities in our own world. And that's not okay. Um, and I think that's in encouraging going forward, but there's that's if that change doesn't come from the people who are at the top, the people who are writing the, in these big, massive um, gaming communities, mm -hmm. it's still such a problem of gatekeeping where all of the um, ingenuity and innovation that are coming from players at the grassroots level, take the combat wheelchair, for example, that um, mm -hmm. that is just fantastic. If that's not um, incorporated into uh, into the handbooks, like I can still see there being a problem of of pushback from the community of being like, oh well, it's not, it's it's too powerful, or it doesn't make sense in D and D in a game where there's dragons and magic, like you know. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was a bit of a a word vomit ramble, but. Um, I'd be interested no, to hear your thoughts. I, I, I feel that. I feel that. Don't don't forget that uh, Wizards of the Coast and therefore Hasbro uh, are in their best interest to uh, do their best to say that they are making a lot of new progressive content 
even mm -hmm. though you can still buy Oriental Adventures on DMs Guild for oh. basically nothing. So you know, uh, the the uh, uh, what what they say and what they're actually doing are sometimes two separate things, and you need to kind of retain both in mind. Um, what you say about um, the who who the onus is on to to make the content unproblematic is an interesting multi layered thing because. Uh, especially within the realms of cyberpunk, for example, where uh, a lot of cyberpunk fiction and therefore the games inspired by it take um, uh, biomodification and cybernetics as a thing where you lose one's humanity, but uh, like disabled and queer people have been body hacking themselves long before tech bros thought it cool to put magnets in their fingers or whatever. Um, so <laughs> the games that talk about humanity as a stat that can be reduced by cyberizing yourself is a problematic thing if you use the wording that's in the book, but it can be worked around. And I, a while ago, I had a conversation with somebody on Twitter um, where we were on very different sides of it, where they were like, hey, new games need to be released to that fix this. And I'm like, that's true. But if we're all as punk rock as we say we are uh, on the internet, we should maybe also be really enthusiastic about hacking to make the content we want to make and then push for better things down the line. But also, uh, you know, the, it's, uh, it's also the action that you can put upon yourself to make it the content you want to be. Uh, also, there are so many games out there there now um if if one game is not fit for purpose in terms of the the content it wants to explore there are other games um mm -hmm. in most recent conversations about how we can move away from the kind of like combat first colonialist nature of dungeons and dragons uh there's been movements in the southeast asian community and uh in the african-american community um making new rpgs that fulfill all those high fantasy tropes but with the cultural backing that they are more familiar with and want to explore uh swordsfall comes to mind uh recently there's been the motherlands rpg streams and both of those cover uh uh, uh african uh, as a, a, a the continent of africa and its culture worked into high fantasy uh within rpg southeast asia or rpg c uh there is what was announced very very recently like literally today uh character the island kingdoms uh, being a, a new kind of like a, a high fantasy setting that specifically uh, uses Southeast Asian culture layered that in. So there are there are other options uh, that you can that you can tailor to the community of people playing. I, I always find it a little weird to kind of talk about black culture put into uh, uh, RPGs because they are either talking about African American culture or African culture, to which I am neither. I am British Caribbean, <laughs> um, to which there is no representation of in anything, really. Uh, and I, 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 I always feel a little bit inauthentic when I talk about that kind of experience, because it's it's not my own in a way, but I, I don't know. Um, maybe eventually, uh, am, I, am I to write the, the, the British Caribbean high fantasy RPG? I, I won't. But uh, I, I, I get, I, I'm a man, I don't want to make it a fantasy one though. Don't nod enthusiastically and put me up to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, am, I, I will continue to probably run systems that have nothing to do with the specific culture and put my culture into it because I guess I'm more comfortable doing that than making uh, a, a separate module for that. But the availability of that module for other people to explore is great and should exist for the people that want to explore that by far. I think some interesting points kind of spring off from what you've just said, Nathan. Um, so you mentioned uh, hacking, taking existing content, repurposing it, updating it, changing it, making it better. Uh, specifically, I think it's really interesting you mentioned Character. So it's uh, the new project um, that's meant to be, uh, as I understand it, from the, the, the little I've seen because it's just been announced, uh, recontextualizing and updating a very old problematic set of, of world building in the Forgotten Realms, I think it was. Uh, which is a setting, uh, the canon setting, so to speak, for Dungeons and Dragons. That's the, the story they use. But Character was a place in the Forgotten Realms, and it was so loaded with some really rough tropes. And I feel it's so interesting that it's a reclaiming of that. It's that hacking uh, or, or modding uh, mindset to take something that has otherwise just perpetuated a lot of harm and then completely flip it and actually turn it into something that hopefully will be uh, changing that in how people's opinions uh, mm -hmm. Seeing. Um, own, own voices can go. Oh, so go ahead. I, I just wondered if I could share an instance of hacking that I tried to do uh, with re seizing the narrative for my for my own means. I play uh, Dungeons and Dragons, 
along with so much of the world now. And um, I got really excited about the Blood Hunter class when it was first released. It was broken as hell. Pardon my language. Um, <laughs> the character eventually became a warlock. Anyway, but the thing that excited me so much about it was uh, I'm a person with chronic illness. And Sunday is terrible pain. And there was just a sentence. It was just a sentence. It, nothing went anywhere with it, but said that blood hunters, after they go through the blood hunter transformation, will have like inter internal scars. And I have internal scars. And, and I was just like, oh my God. And I wrote this whole thing for my DM because uh, I'm the worst player ever who shows up with like 10 pages of backstory on the first game. And I wrote this whole <laughs> thing. I was like, I want you to roll a die at the start of every day. And that will dictate whether or not my character is experiencing chronic pain or not. He was not enthusiastic about this, but I was like, no, yes. And there, you know, and I was willing to like take disadvantages in battle or something just to like, just to experience the character that, that, that lived like me, but still went charging in with a sword. I love, a, I love a lady with swords, like Sally was saying, um, you know, that didn't work out. Um, I think because maybe I didn't communicate what need that was that was meeting for me to my dm i think he thought i was overcomplicating things um so now i'm writing a novel where like there's lots of chronic illness and i'm you know get to get to explore that on my own um but it yeah it was it was one sentence in the description that didn't lead to anywhere but i was like that that's me that's me right mm. there i was so excited about that so anyway yeah, I, I know that's tangential I, but i just had to share Oh, no, That's for real, awesome. that was actually uh, matched up with the point that I was going to raise, that own voices count for a lot. Um, I think in that particular example, if that was in a book where you didn't know that somebody who was writing that had chronic illness, and then they put in a whole bunch of rules why somebody suffering from chronic illness would be having a worse time of it, uh, people would be like, why are you impinging? So it, coming from a person who has their own experiences a lot, I'm allowed to write lots of gay characters who are terrible people. Um, whereas other, because you know that's that's the thing. There's there's the idea of like, oh, you can't depict LGBTQ plus people as problematic uh, mm -hmm. uh, at all. And I guess yeah, you probably shouldn't if you're not LGBTQ plus yourself. I don't want to hear your opinions on how we might be flawed people. Uh, but I'm more than willing to uh, be create flawed characters uh, and have multiple queer people who are a wide range of different kinds of flaws. And then that works out. Mm -hmm. um, just to jump on that last point, there, I feel people who say we should stop having flawed gay characters kind of do have a point because for a good few years, even now and today, our gay characters are either, either lost their love in a horrible accident or they're going to die or things are going to go bad, and it's not that was a lot of people are saying, "Hey, maybe you should you should not show flawed characters." The most saying, "We're pretty sure you can be gay and also be happy." Can we have that in our media, please? Yeah. I'm looking at you, video games from 2016 onwards, and <laughs> that's kind of the real point we want to try and grasp on because we want to be like, "Give us happy gay characters. Give us gay characters." Don't make them be dying. Let them actually mm -hmm. have a life and be cool and be happy and live their live their dreams. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. kind of what people want. I agree. No, it's, I feel that. Yeah, make mm -hmm. characters that are flawed and gay. Don't make characters that are gay and because of it are flawed. That's it's the wrong mm -hmm. way around. Mm -hmm. I, I feel yeah. it's also uh, quite the same. Um, Lizzie, you were talking about uh, own voice being important, but also how in Glasgow, just that one book is such yeah. a huge foundational part of their English curriculum. Uh, I actually looked it up. You said it was published oh, you know, only like 10 years ago. It's actually published in 2005. <laughs> so over a decade ago. 10 years ago? What? Yeah. <laughs> it? It, it flies. But um, that book just being about people from that place using their language with locations they can identify with and narratives that they can understand. Everyone's going to understand at some point some of the issues that are going on in those books, even though it might be a little bit over the top because you've got to cram a lot in. It's still, someone's going to read that and they're going to see themselves and get it in the same way that you needed to have that character who's disabled in the same way that Nathan, we need characters that are gay, that just happen to be gay. No other reason, just are gay. It's nice. 
Um, I'm also autistic, and I have not seen any disabled representation in any kind of role-playing game that isn't like the straight up, what do you think of when you see a disabled person? Oh, well, they've got crutches or they're using a wheelchair. I feel like that's as far as we get when we come to disabled content in the mainstream anyway. And even then, a lot of it, until recently when people who are disabled start writing their own hacks for it, a lot of the mainstream has been, you're disabled, you have a negative score to dexterity and that's your life now. As opposed to going, well, they have one leg, but that doesn't mean they're lesser or that they're useless or something, which is just a really horrible narrative. So when we kind of... we. When I've seen stuff people be making very recently for, say, autism or for, for depression and seeing that explored through role-playing games, it makes me so happy because not only do I see myself, but also I realize that I'm not alone. I feel like that's the kind of the point I was I was trying to get around to with the, 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 the book that, Lizzie, you mentioned. Um, what was it called? Uh, Torn Cities? Twin Cities? Uh, Divided Cities. Divided Cities. Yes. It's, it's this essential look of you didn't realize that this was a thing that other people had to deal with or that they experienced or that they felt about and then someone puts on a page and then suddenly you find you're crying like it's it's an insane way of connecting people an insanely good way of connecting people uh lloyd you had something to say oh no he's muted um hello yeah here we go it's very short um can we can we stop having disability factors as flaws to give people points in character generation is that a, is that a thing we can do i mean i mean i'm sure there's other ways we can deal with it but can it be oh you have one hand therefore you now have 12 points to spend you have no legs therefore here's 15 points now make your samurai throw fireballs i mean can we, can we, just, can we just not can we just not have that anymore I, I, I... guts is shook right now <laughs> <laughs> oh uh shadowrun fifth edition who i don't know her <laughs> In the in, oh in the novel God. I'm currently writing, the main character is the only person in her world that doesn't have magic because she has a chronic illness that prevents her from having magic. And I'm so excited for the point that she can just walk through other people's magical force fields because she's magically neutral. Just like bye. <laughs> um, yeah, like I like I know it. I, well, I'm obviously I'm having friends who have like physical disabilities like read this book because everyone who reads it, they're like, oh, she has a disability. I'm like, she has a chronic illness that so is slightly different. But yeah, it doesn't have to be like, oh, Daredevil is blind. And now, of course, he has like superpowers. It can be like, this is Steve. It's, he's, he's still a samurai. It doesn't matter how many hands he has. He's still going to like wreck your day. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I love one-handed Samurai Steve and the <laughs> one shot about them immediately. <laughs> I think something that we're um something that I I find we get some pushback with um writing specifically um historical content, whether it's um uh, an article interpreting something from a different point of view. Uh like our queering archaeology article or or creating um, some historical fiction is we do get some pushback from people being like, well, how do you know there were black people in Ayrshire in 800 AD? Or how do you know that there was um, this disabled person? Like, show me the evidence. And it's like, <laughs> unless you have empirical proof, like, um, I don't know, DNA samples and documents and stuff, it, there is a lot of pushback with people willing to or rather not willing to change um, the narrative that that they're used to. Um, and and I think that's something that Carved in Stone um, might be faced with and, and just has to say, look, here's, here's the evidence, here's the context. And we, we don't have to have um, letters or, uh, or an image of, of this character to know that um, that the, this representation of them in the game um, is historically faithful. But it's, yeah, it is pushback we get. And also, I think something with, with Scottish history as well, in particular, um, and it does have a lot to do with, uh, with modern politics and nationalism, is this idea of, um, of what Scotland has historically looked like as we, as we go back through the centuries and through the millennia. Um, we still get people who, um, comment whenever we write anything about the Romans being like oh could you do some Scottish history like and I'm like but it is Scottish history like and 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 people imagining um 
different groups like Picts and Romans and Vikings that they that they never never the twain shall meet and they just you know um but but this is scotland and it, and it is a, a wonderful melting pot um of these people and and hopefully i i think this is what carved in stone will um will present a different kind mm. of narrative on the point of presenting narratives i think it'd be interesting to hear from you justin about some difficulties maybe your students experienced in creating games to represent their narratives uh maybe hang-ups or misconceptions that they had about the experience that you had to break down or maybe there were some issues that you had in passing on to them. Um, wait, I'll rephrase that. Issues you had communicating to them because of misconceptions, not that you're like, here are my issues. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's the, I, I've really been enjoying this conversation and just listening. And I think that that's a major part of how I teach as well. Um, I am very aware of my position as a um, white cisset, you know, presenting guy in front of a classroom. Um, and I'm also aware of the fact that the material that I present to my students is in a, in its own way, you know, a little bit of a dominant discourse, right? Like we have 16 weeks to make it through the material for the course. And so I have to be very intentional and selective about the text that I assign, including the games or the fact that I'm even presenting games, right? Um, so oftentimes when I present, uh, when I'm putting, when I'm curating rather my, my text list, I will try and work in as many own voice texts as humanly possible. Um, there are occasions where we have to work from um, something that is canonically white. Um, my Foundations of Lit course is a really good example. We have to work through, um, you know, major literary genres, uh, drama and poetry and prose and something else. And so I really wanted to focus like that course, just as a, as a for instance, um, on children's literature. And so we worked with Shakespeare and that was really like the only white voice that we they worked from, mostly to use Shakespeare as a jumping off point for um, texts like um, uh, Tony Medina and John Jennings and Stacey Robinson's um, I Am Alfonso Jones, which is this really incredible uh, graphic novel. It's like one of the very first, if not the first graphic novel to deal with um, uh, police brutality and racial protest for young readers, right? It's really brutal, but it also has a really important through line of um, Hamlet because they use it in the text, right? So for my class, uh, like for all my classes, I always try and couch and contextualize as much as possible. We're going to work through these texts to get to these trajectories. There's no like, gotcha moments. There's no like pulling out the rug uh, from underneath of them. I'm always trying to be really upfront about how I teach. And also to, to kind of mention it, you know, I also explain like when I don't know something or like, I'm fully aware that I'm teaching to a group of, you know, 40 some odd adults who all have experiences and histories and specialties. Right. And so oftentimes I try to present material so that we can have a conversation, a dialogue and work through this material together, because otherwise it's just me shouting into the void about stuff that I think we should talk about. But that's not helpful for anyone. I want people to work through this material. I want people to work through these games, right? And to kind of um, tie back into some of the other conversations um, in terms of seeing representation and trying to make opportunities for that. Part of why I had my students make those game zines is that originally we were going to have a zine showcase where they were going to present their work on campus in a public space. Uh, they were gonna invite people, they were going to show off their work, um, you know, and they were going to uh, contribute those zines to our collection so that future classes could work with those game zines so that future students could actually see themselves, you know, reflected in those zines, right? Like, oh, my roommate made that zine and now I'm working with it in another class. With COVID, we had to pivot that entirely because back in March, right smack dab in the half halfway point of my class, Michigan State went fully online. So then we had to like, I had to work with my students to make new making practices. So there was a lot of back and forthing about what each student could do on their own and what they could do within the confines of getting something done to get out of the class, because I wasn't going to, you know, make them bend over backwards just to make a thing. So there is a lot of 
editorial work as well as teaching stuff of like, all right, you need to be intentional about what you're making, but you also need to get through the class because it's COVID and everything is insane to put it lightly. So um, yeah, I, I, tangent, I, I, I'm hopefully something cogent came out of that. <laughs> Actually, I had a wee question kind of inspired a little bit by the, the chat um, that everyone's been coming up with. Actually, my first question was, um, Nathan, can I use the phrase, shenanigans occur? Um, <laughs> you know, it's just like, that's going to be perfect for explaining why we went X amount over budget. Just like a <laughs> yeah, shenanigans you know, occurred. It, it worked yeah. in any board meeting. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, what can we do? It's just one of those things. Um, <laughs> that one was like... It, Archaeology, um, we, we've got a diversity problem um, in, in many respects. Um, we're 99% white. Um, the routes into archaeology tend to be through university, tends to be through university degrees. So, you know, that kind of brings in its own barriers. I was kind of wondering what the game sector, however that's, you know, construed, what that looks like. Um, and are there lessons from your sectors to archaeology and how we could do things better in, in, in heritage. All looking really confused. <laughs> like a lot to think publishing about. Publishing is it's super yeah. hard. Yeah. Publishing is mad hard. I don't know if you've ever if you've ever done a PDF layout before. It feels like you need a degree just to do that. Um, unfortunately, um, so I, 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 I think there is definitely the grassroots and zine making world and the like sheer amount of creativity and, uh, push through of new ideas is not locked to any kind of educational background, but I think access to the tools for those things is unfortunately socioeconomically locked. Um, because while I would love for a direct uh, jump back to the kind of like photocopying era of zine making um, because that was that was sick. I love that so much. Um, where, <laughs> I, I made a zine last year. Time is weird. Um, yeah. And a lot of the test builds for that was photocopying things through and I felt proper 90s. It was great. Um, but, you know, uh, that, that is, it's very hard to get the word out that way uh, a lot of the time. Uh, there are increasingly within the indie RPG world uh, movements and uh, shared funding and being able to kind of get uh, community copies of bits and pieces so you can kind of uh, get more entrenched in the world and get access to those resources. Um, but it can be really difficult to even know that those exist unless you're already in the sphere uh, or the ivory tower, depending on what shape you want to make the community uh, to, to have that, that organizations exist. Maybe that's just what community center stuff is now. Like from... Uh, what that the community centers back when I was like in the when I was like a 10 year old, uh, that was mostly uh, learning how to play uh, 21s and watching X Men Evolution. But uh, a lot of the kind of like craft courses for kind of like after school camps, because I was in a lot of those kind of after school, after school and summer camps, because both my parents worked uh, and they didn't want us just wandering around the streets of Walthamstow and Leighton like proper hard boys. <laughs> um, so yeah, those kind of communities were really, really good at getting people together and earnestly being interested in making things. So maybe the in introducing people to the world of tabletop RPG and making games and playing games and that's the device to have that happen now is through those kind of community spaces uh, i know that in the kind of like beat making communities uh being because you know uh, among at least kids of what of my background when i was a teenager a lot of them are into beat making now and have been for the last 10 years um so a lot of those after school clubs are about how to use cubase uh, how to use FL Studio, um, how to start making terrible beats, because the first thing you make of any creative endeavor is <laughs> going to be awful. <laughs> Nobody's going to end the thing straight away. But encouraging them to take those first steps, you know what I mean? So maybe that's maybe that's the way of kind of getting everybody in is kind of like, a, I guess what Sasha Coward's doing, right? Of having those kind of like youth group focused things on making stuff. That's escape rooms based around archaeology or a mythology, but this could be tabletop RPGs that inspire about wider thinkings in academia at a kind of really approachable entry level for teenagers. Um, to, to piggyback off of that, um, for, for me, um, 
you know, a lot of the work that I do with games is in the classroom space and also in my academic writing. And a big part of me kind of goes along like two parallel and intersected like lines, which is um, inviting collaboration and making space for collaborators who have different perspectives, different backgrounds and different specialties, because I can't, I don't know everything and don't presume to at all. And therefore, anytime that I get to collaborate with people, invite other um, experts into my classroom, um, I feel only enriches the experience for everyone, including like critical making. Like in that games class, for example, I was able to uh, get Adam Vass, who goes, who creates games under World Champ Game Co. Uh, Adam was able to Skype into our class and speak with all of my students. And so they actually got to speak with a zinester. Uh, funnily enough, I got to give them a draft copy of Dungeons on a Dime from Brian, which I was really thankful for, because they, I wanted to give them something that wasn't, we, we studied D&D, but they also got to see other entry level, or I guess really accessible approaches to RPGs. And the other, the, the kind of flip side is using our space and privilege to call out like avenues and bastions of whiteness whenever we possibly can, whether that's implicit or explicit whiteness, including again, using our space to invite other collaborators to make every space less white, less, you know, dominant, less one voice, essentially. Um, but that's being much more critical about like citation practices in academia or whether that's just being more critical about like the game systems we use and um, hack even those kinds of things. So, yeah. So I want to preface this with two things. First of all, we're coming up to an hour and a half, so we're going to be rounding up soon, which sucks because I want to keep talking. Um, but this is, I'm going to be handing over to Lloyd for the last little bit before we have any final thoughts. Um, but I want to preface this springing off of what Jeff was saying and start with the question of like accessibility and understanding of the industry and how does it work. Something I've noticed about tabletop role-playing game publishing is that it is all self-publishing. Every single company is a self-publisher. Even with the Coast, at its heart, is only publishing Dungeons and Dragons stuff. They're not out there going, oh, well, you know, let's do a bit of Pathfinder because I know they kind of liked our rules and they're kind of similar. You know what, let's try it out. There's no, there's no random house. There's no penguin of role-playing game publishers. So knowing that it's all, in the way that self-publishing is, it's all about you and it's all about the stuff that you work for, even in large companies, what is it like in terms of working for uh, tabletop role-playing publishers as a writer? What is it like creating that content? And uh, how is that workflow, how is it, the, I don't know if I say it, how easy is it to get into? How is easy is it to stay? What does it look like working in that sort of environment? Well, the first thing you have to note when it comes to working environment is that there is no easy way to get into it and stay. A lot of companies, a lot of places, because they're all, so every company has their own way of doing the thing. Everyone has their own technique. Everyone has their own recruitment policy. Some people will just not work with like any person who's not written like 12 RPGs. Some people are like, nope, give me, if you're new, you know, then before come in. And the thing that really matters is that it's all about getting your foot in the door and ensuring that you can do constant work. As long as you can show you can do constant work and you can do good work, you will build up yourself to get that area. And it's about increasing your portfolio. Start small. I started small. I did a very small RPG called Bastion. It wasn't massive. It wasn't like over the top, amazingly huge, but I loved it. It was freaking great. And I worked my way through it. And it's all about beginning and working your way up to where you want to be when it comes to that. And it's also about playing a lot of RPGs with these people. Because the more RPGs you play, the more you're going to be seen playing the RPGs, the more people are going to know you like those RPGs, no, 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 except that you will be up for it. And the final big thing in the whole idea is that don't be afraid to change your perception of the RPG industry and RPGs themselves when it comes to writing. You are writing, usually when you write, you write with a specific voice then that voice should match all like a lot of people don't believe this right when i go hey do you know rpgs are written by like 12 people writing different chapters and it's put together and they're like why and i'm like because it's way easier to do it that way you get multiple people coming in they all have the same voice you have people with expertise in certain sections and they make it work and then they'll be like i don't understand how that works i don't get it and i'm like that's why you're not in the rpg industry but that's not the point um so it's all about figuring out do you know how many versions of the Monkey King story there are? 
a lot. It goes from typical monkey king. I'm off my way. Got my boss. Got my boys. Got my back. My piggy. We're gonna go over there. We're gonna get the boy. Come back all the way to technically Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> and you cannot say the same person that started off with that story about the sage from heaven and hell. What's called sage of heaven and earth is the same person that decided to make Goku throw fireballs. You have to write your story and your writing to match what is there. And once you get, and once you can prove you can do that, you will be working in the RPG industry. And that's the more important part. It's not like writing a normal book, and it's not like writing a, um, not like writing like a manual. It's all about the voice that you put on, and people take it in, and that's what's important. Awesome. So before we close out, does anyone have any like final thoughts, things they wanted to raise, burps, anything that you just want to throw out on camera before we stop? <laughs> I have one. Go for it. Um, there is one book that is uh, full of misconceptions that we will always respect and use from time memorial all the way through. It's called the Bible. Okay, carry on. Hmm. Some lovely spicy hot takes. Uh, I mean, be gay, do crime is what I would uh, say is a primary point of uh, learning <laughs> to go on for in most endeavors. Uh, <laughs> is is what I can offer as a final thought. I think that probably fills in most of what I do. <laughs> be gay, do crime. <laughs> Just collaborative storytelling crime, you know. Uh, mm. <laughs> mm. It was fictional, honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's the the fiction that inspires us to do great things in real life. Mm. <laughs> um, I my my general plea is to all all you creators out there, please make things with children in mind. Uh, and I don't mean cut out the the sexy bits. I mean <laughs> think about what's relevant um, to children because a start them young and they will keep buying your stuff. Um, but b there's 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 such a strong need uh, for material that, uh, especially um, children who don't engage with reading, um, if they can engage with games, it still opens up so much of the world to them. Uh, they still gain the skills they need and the experience they need. Um, so make make things for the youths, please. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Sally, Justin, Jeff, anyone got a last thought? Um, I, well, I'm super duper excited now to get stuck into some indie TTRPGs. I am so excited. So thank you for, um, inspiring me in this session. Um, and I guess my last word, if there's anybody in the, um, museums or heritage sector that's watching this panel, um, looking for inspiration and looking for ideas, um, pay your freelancers. I'm going to get a tattoo tomorrow. <laughs> my last word we'll hold you to it um i i think if if i have one last final thought um i want to quote a, a a pal of mine uh comic scholar and creator nick Susanis, um who also does some really great work with games um and he said earlier and it's this phrase that has stuck with me um that uh, in his courses, he tells students that uh, we will learn and we will play. And over the course of the class, we will see that those two things are not so different there after all. And that's kind of an ethos that I've took taken to heart because I, I often think that when we play, we learn. When we learn, we learn by playing and it, they're very intertwined, so. That is really sweet. I love that. <laughs> Uh, also, just quick plug, uh, Nick Susanis' work is amazing. He did a uh, graphic novel as dissertation, and his website has a ton of really free-to-use and freely accessible uh, learning activities with comics and critical making. Um, go get it and go follow. That's amazing. Cool. I'm, um, I've learned a lot. I'm going to go away and finish Kenneth Rice, Vampire Hunter. Um, I'm going to think about um, how we can actually take a lot of what you guys have said into carved in stone and make it really uh, kick ass. So thank you all. Yeah, this has been a really fantastic panel. I have really enjoyed talking to all of you and I hope we can talk again soon in the future as well. 
Uh, I think we should end off just by reintroducing ourselves. Um, and then we'll all say goodbye for a really awkward long period of time before I click hang up. <laughs> so I have been Brian. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I run the publishing imprint Dungeons on a Dime, focusing on entry-level role-playing content, helping people get into games and stick with them. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to hand over to Jeff to reintroduce himself. Hi, I'm Jeff Sanders. I'm an archaeologist. I run Digit at the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, and my pronouns are he, him. Uh, next over to Lloyd. Hi, I'm Lloyd, and I'm amazing, and I love you all. Please come back. Yay! <laughs> We've got Lizzie. Hello, I have been and remain Lizzie Simonen. I use she, her pronouns. I am a librarian slash fantasy person. Make things for kids. Thank you. Amazing. Next up, Nathan. Hi, I'm an endless void with immaculate highlighter, Nathan Blades. Uh, <laughs> you can find me on twitch.tv forward slash the neon caster. And if you want to play my indie games, you can go to sixofspades.itch.io and give me some coin for some good games. Money. Indeed. We love the exchange of money. Oh, <laughs> next up, we have got Justin. <laughs> Uh, I'm Justin Weigard, he, him pronouns. I'm a PhD candidate at Michigan State University. Um, I do comic studies, game studies, digital humanities. You can find more of my work just by Googling Justin Weigard. Go on my website, justinweigard.com. And I want to thank everyone for a really great panel because I uh, learned so much. So, And also, I love you all too. It's great. <laughs> Aww. And last but not least, Sally. I'm Sally Pentecost. I'm a uh, heritage professional working in communications and policy making. I currently work for the Digit Project. Um, you can find me on Twitter uh, at her underscore med underscore Scott, stands for Her Medieval Scotland. Um, and yeah, love you all, pay you freelancers. Amazing. We love it. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm now going to hit stop recording. Goodbye for now. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>